Our Heavenly Father, we have heard the word intriguing used uh, as characteristic of this particular study, and indeed it is. Uh, we are fascinated by what happened in eternity past, but Lord, we're even uh, more fascinated by the fact that we are part of the resolution of the whole affair that started uh, years and years ago. And I pray, Lord, that you'll help us to realize that we shouldn't miss our window of opportunity, that you'll help us do our best for you now so that we might help in the efforts of Christ, his sufferings, in winning the overall angelic conflict. In his name we pray. Amen. Uh, I had some good discussion. I've had it ever since we started uh, way back when on uh, Declaration Day. Uh, and uh, involving the rapture and what's going to happen and then talking about uh, how we're going to be caught up and the rewards there and the like. And I've had some good response and uh, even better with regard to this. And it, actually it's based on questions that many of you have had. And by the way, um, this is a, a side two of the tape. It's part two of Operation Footstool and we're in 1 Kings uh, chapter 5. But before we get there, Again, just a brief bit of review. We're talking about, in Operation Footstool, how God explained to his son what he was going to do to win the angelic conflict. And that was that he was going to put all his enemies under his feet. And that if Christ, within the allotted time, could do this, then uh, he would win. But then on the other hand, you have your nemesis, Lucifer. He is going to try to prevent Christ from doing this and in effect set up his own counterfeit kingdom. I don't know whether you know it or not, but all the way from liberal politics to environmentalism to liberal religions, that's all uh, satanically inspired in order to bring about a better world, the brotherhood of man. We just are, have so many warm fuzzies on this planet. We love one another. We'll have peace apart from the Prince of Peace. But then again, that's what evil is, the good apart from God. But it's human good, human wisdom. And that's where we are today. And I just heard some disturbing things with regard to that a little bit ago, and not go into it, but with regard to big crowds, a whole lot of people. You see, most churches out there have program-itis, and it is a disease. They need to be inoculated with, uh, with something. It's called doctrine. And it doesn't matter how big your church edifice is, how many numerically you have, how many fun and games you have, the little kitties having a great time in church, and the guy behind the pulpit is flat lying through his teeth. It doesn't matter. Often, uh, in defense of our own ministry, I want to say, I'm going to let the Bema do my talking. When your life goes up in smoke and our lives together uh, collectively, those of us who have suffered with Christ in, in this business are, are outshining you all. Um, I guess uh, because I won't have a sin nature, I can't thumb my nose at you, but I'll tell you what, I certainly am going to say, I told you so. Uh, big dummy, well, I can't do that either. But uh, it, it, just, it just absolutely it, it grates me. Oh boy, we all had this, that, and the other, and, and so many. Well, how did you get them there? How are you going to keep them? What is the underlying motivation of the whole thing? If it is not a volition that is dead set on winning the angelic uh, conflict through getting as much doctrine as you can, the whole motivation, that whole church service, in my opinion, is wrong. And uh, my opinion is backed up by scripture, and I want to ask these folks, Show me from the scripture where your opinion is backed up. Just two or three verses. I would, I would appreciate it. Make me eat my words. That's, all, that's almost a dare, but it is, it, that's, what, that's what it is. It just um, gets to the point where you say, ha, ah, here we go again. Another so-called grace believer has bitten the dust. But we're going to proceed on. Uh, it's, it's not going to get easier, but it doesn't mean you can't have some sanctified frustration once in a while. When it started originally, uh, and I've had these questions, we had the angelic population split 
into one-third and two-thirds. And of course, the two-thirds rounded up the one-third. I believe they were rounded up in a big cosmic battle that was centered in our solar system here. Lucifer's headquarters, his, his reserves, were here on this planet. He came back, he was knocked here actually. He came back here, he gathered his, uh, his uh, 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 angels. Uh, the two-thirds surrounded this, plan uh, this uh, solar system, they closed in on them, they captured them and they had a trial. That's what Satan means, the adversary, and devil means the accuser. And Satan is Christ's adversary, and the accuser means that he said that to God the Father, uh, you're unjust in putting him on the throne. I sh deserve to be there rather than your son. Uh, uh, just nepotism, family favorite, and, and so forth. Now, up until this particular point, two-thirds of the angels said, okay, God, what are we going to do with them? God said, there's a lake of fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Let's throw them in there. And the devil said, okay, now what? We're in a court of law here, like a good uh, <laughs> criminal trial lawyer. I, I appeal. <laughs> Wait one second, I've got a question. Let's, let's see if you can answer this one, God. There's only one way that can be answered. And I've, I've said this lots of times. I do not mean to be redundant, but it is the point of the whole thing. If your son were made on an equal plane with me, make him an angel, delimit his powers to an angel, and have him fight with me a, 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 over a given space of time, I'll show you I can win. And God the Father said, I'll go you one better. I will make him lower than the angels. Now, that was the question. Lucifer said, I can beat Christ. Now, one third of the angels already disbelieved in Jesus Christ. But God would not have had to go through all of this if the other two thirds of the angels, including the big guns, Michael, Gabriel, and at that time, Apollyon, had not said, well, we'd like to have this thing resolved. No, no, I'll, stay, I'll do what Christ says, but in the long run, I, I thank God you need to do this, because if you don't do it, there's always going to be that doubt in our minds. And so God said, big mistake. He charged his angels with folly. The heavens were not clean in his sight. Uh, the stars are not pure in his sight. And that simply means, and those verses of scripture are, are recorded on our handout sheet, that simply means that there was not one person or place that was not contaminated with the seeds of Lucifer's doubt. Now because of that, guys like Michael and Gabriel, uh, hey, we like these guys, uh, they're, they're, they're on our side, at least we think, <laughs> But uh, yes, they are. They, they have not revolted as, as yet against him. They're staying true to Christ, and we'll, we'll deal with that uh, here. But originally, they forced the hand of the Father to prove the worth of the Son. We're not going to let him reign over us until we're sure he's the right man for the job. And so, on goes the angelic conflict, and that's where we are. Uh, so we then started our, um, our uh, pursuit of defining what Operation Footstool is. Operation Footstool is the name that all, God almost gave, because one half of this is, is what God himself used, in identifying the proceedings of Christ to the end of the conflict. What is his main objective? He is going to take his foot and put it on the throat of his enemies and declare he's won. Now, we saw some verses of scripture uh, that used words like, uh, until he subdues them. Because, um, and this is the, we're not going to go into it now, we did the first hour. But um, many have asked the question, well now, Pastor, you, you, you seem unsure. No, I'm absolutely sure Jesus Christ is going to win. But I am also absolutely sure that it is open for debate. That's the conflict. If God automatically gave him the win, Lucifer's going to cry what? What would you cry? Foul, cheat, no, that's wrong. 
uh, yeah, sure, this isn't a fair contest. Make it fair. So God made it so fair, he made Christ inferior mentally and physically to Lucifer using divine operating assets to defeat this powerful being uh, as a man. And he did. But it's still not over yet. He's not going to win until he makes his foes his footstool. And he's got seven avowed eternal enemies that we'll consider that um, he must subdue before he wins. Okay, uh, so we saw that uh, words like when he puts them, then uh, he'll, he'll have this. So when and then indicate that it's not done as yet. But now, uh, before we get to considering these things, there are two things that you need to know about what they thought when fa the Father said this. The angels understood, and we can from the word, that there are two gestures in this business of the footstool, the ancient concept. One is the gesture of conquest, the other is the gesture of possession. We're in 1 Kings chapter 5. We've already read Joshua 4 where all of his men put the, their feet on the necks of their enemies. That's what Operation Footstool is. Chapter 5 and verse 3. You know how that David my father could not build a house unto the name of the Lord his God for the wars which were about him on every side. Now note this phrase. It's interesting. It's what Operation Footstool is all about until the Lord put them under the soles of his feet. Now what does that mean? David went out and conquered his enemies, put his foot on their throat and put his sword in their heart. Simple as that. That's how you win the battle. Uh, verse number four. Now the Lord my God has given me rest on every side so that there is neither adversary nor evil occurrent. What's that mean? Peace. What does Jesus Christ have to do to reconcile all things to himself and bring about universal peace? Put his foot on the neck of his enemy, put his sword in their heart. Only then, these enemies cannot be won over. These enemies are not, well, uh, they're not able to be rehabilitated. Uh, you, you, you cannot do it. You can't bring them over to, to Christ. Uh, their, their doom is signed and sealed. The only way they can reverse it is to win this conflict. All right, let's go to one more Davidic Psalm. Psalms 18. And verse number 33. Now, we're talking here about the gesture of conquest. It says, He makes my feet like hinds feet and setteth me upon high places. Come down to verse 36. You have enlarged my steps under me that my feet did not slip. Uh, why does the Bible say you have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of, of peace? Because the Roman soldiers had good treads on their shoes. Uh, it, you, it's the last thing you want to do in battle when you're, when you're sword fighting is have your feet slip out from under you. I mean, that's the very last thing. So what? You have to be sure-footed. That's what Operation Footstool is all about. I pursued mine enemies and overtook them. Neither did I turn again till they were consumed. I have wounded them that they were not able to rise. They are fallen under my feet. Operation Footstool. Thou hast girded me with strength in the battle. You have subdued under me those that rose up against me. Now this is the Davidic Psalm. That's how he put down all this so that there was no longer an adversary or evil occurrence, an uprising. But how did he do it? He put his feet on the necks of the enemies that opposed him. That's how he won. By the way, that's how you win a, a battle. That's how you win a war. That's why the, the World War II generation was so great. Because they understood that uh, they were either going to speak German or Japanese if they did not make the Japanese and Germans speak English. You, you understand that? Uh, that they were either going to have to shoot and kill them or they were going to, they were going to be killed. 
Now, since that time, liberalism has set in and the bleeding hearts and we don't want to destroy our enemies. Nonsense. I say, if they're out to destroy us, nuke them, the SOBs, sons of Belial. All right, you, you thought I said something else, didn't you? They cried, there was none to save them, even unto the Lord, but he answered them not. You get this? They're underneath his foot. He's about to plunge the sword, and they say, help me, God. <laughs> and you know what he did? He cut off the sound, pulled the plug. Then did I beat them small as the dust before the wind. I did cast them out as the dirt in the streets. Thou hast delivered me from the strivings of the people. Thou hast made me the head of the heathen. A people whom I have not known shall serve me. Uh, keep on reading here. As soon as they hear of me, they shall obey me. Strangers shall submit themselves unto me. What are we talking about here? Through this Davidic psalm, we are understanding Operation Footstool. How is Jesus Christ going to get, subdue all things to himself? By doing just this. He is going to control one way or the other. He is either going to vanquish his foes or his foes are going to kneel in humble obedience to his rule. The strangers shall fade away and be afraid out of their close places. The Lord lives and blessed be my rock, the God of my salvation. Uh, just a few more verses here. It is God that avenges me and subdues the people under me. Operation Footstool. He delivers me from mine enemies. Yea, thou liftest me up above those that rise up against me. Thou hast delivered me from the violent man. Lucifer, Ezekiel 28. Your heart was filled with what? Violence. Violence. Uh, and that is exactly the feelings that Lucifer has against Jesus Christ. Those are the feelings he has against you, by the way. But he just simply right now has to play by the rules. Uh, he can't, uh, he can't uh, slit your throat, but he would if he could. Why? Because John 8, 44, he was a murderer from the beginning. And he'd just as soon do away with you so you wouldn't have to <laughs> be testing you all the time. Okay. Therefore will I give thanks to the Lord among the heathen, Great deliverance giveth me to his, giveth he to his king. He shows mercy to David and his seed forever. Okay, I think that is sufficient. We could go to other verses, but to prove the gesture of conquest. Subdued under the feet, feet on the necks of the enemies. Now, the point that we're making here is that Ephesians chapter 6 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers uh, in, the, in the heavenly places, um, uh, wickedness in the heavenly places. Now, that is wrestling and with the armor of God and the sword of the Spirit. And though we do not see our foes, the concept is the same. In order to get promoted to the next level, you've got to put your foot on the neck of that angel and plunge in the sword. It's only then that you advance. We've studied those uh, uh, particulars of advancement before. Okay, let's go to Genesis 13 and look at the other gesture. Genesis 13. And we'll start with verse number 14. This time we're going to look at the gesture of possession because it fits in with the gesture of conquest. The Lord said to Abram, after the lot was separated from him, lift up your eyes now and look for the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. The land which you see, to thee will I give it, and I will make your seed as the dust of the earth, so that no man can num number them. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and the breadth of it, for I will give it thee. Okay, now, this has to do with what's called the gesture of possession. Walking to and fro, up and down, all around the land. Now, we'll go to some other uh, portions of Scripture which... Uh, show us that the feet are still involved in this. Deuteronomy chapter 11. Deuteronomy chapter 11.
and verse 23. Now again, as we're reading these verses, even though they are under a kingdom concept, they illustrate grace truths for us. As Israel had a, a physical enemy and a literal land upon which to place their feet, we have a spiritual enemy and a spiritual land in essence. It's not that it's not real, it is real, but it's just invisible at this point behind the scenes. As they had to put their feet on the necks of their enemies and walk around the land to, to claim it, we have to put our feet on the necks of our enemies so that we can walk around the land and claim it. When we do this, we can walk around and say, hey, this is mine. Verse uh, 23. Then the Lord will drive out these nations from before you. You'll possess greater nations and mightier than yourselves. What do we say in the angelic conflict? There are seven increments of angels that we face. And once we win one category, guess what we have to face? An angel that is stronger and mightier than ourselves. And we have to learn the doctrine in order to conquer that angel. What did Jesus Christ do as a human being to Lucifer? That Lucifer was stronger and mightier than he was, but with divine operating assets, he defeated Lucifer and will defeat him. Okay. Every place whereon the soles of your feet shall tread shall be yours. From the wilderness down, last part of the verse, uh, to the coast. No man shall able, uh, be able to stand before you. The Lord your God shall lay the fear and dread of you on all the land that you'll tread upon. Gesture of possession, chapter 33. This is why we encourage you to get gold, silver, precious stones. Gold, silver, precious stones are indicative that you have defeated an enemies that are stronger and mightier than you and are indicative of a capacity to rule over a certain amount, a measured amount of, 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 of space. Chapter 33, verse 27. It says... Eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. He'll thrust out the enemy from before you and destroy them. Israel then shall dwell in safety alone. How is this going to happen? Verse number 29. Happy are you, Israel, who is like to thee, O people saved by the Lord. Uh, last part of the verse. Your enemy shall be fine liars to you, and you will tread upon their high places. In ancient days... Uh, commanders would, would pick the most advantageous place to engage another army. And if you had to engage an army and uh, you had uh, the choice of the high place or the low place, what would you choose? Well, the high place, why? Well, you, it's easier to shoot downhill. <laughs> it's easier to see what's going if you're up above them. And especially if you've got to engage them in a sword fight and, uh, and with spears, it's easier to run downhill than have an uphill battle all the way. Now, what does this tell me? The soles of their feet are going to be where? On their high places or most advantageous places in the strategy of battle. They win it all, in other words. Okay, let's go to Joshua. Chapter 1, Joshua chapter 1, verse 2, Moses, my servant, is dead. Arise, go over this Jordan, you and all your people, to the land I'll give you. Verse 3, here is the gesture of possession. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given you. And then it lets us know, uh, verse 4, uh, how much land is involved. Verse 5, there shall not any man be able to stand before you all the days of your life. So these are the gestures of possession. I think it would do us good to read one more uh, verse from Joshua, chapter 14 and verse 9. And we'll move on here. And Moses swear on that day, saying, this is Caleb, 
Surely the land whereon thy feet have trodden shall be your inheritance and your children forever, because you wholly followed the Lord. The point that we're making with this particular verse is that not only did the children of Israel in general know the boundaries of their land upon which their feet would trod, but Caleb knew exactly and precisely the amount of land that was promised him because he went in to the promised land, defeated giants that were uh, on, that's where we get the little course, I want that mountain, I want that mountain that the Lord has promised me. And it's a reference to, to Caleb and he went in and there were giants in the land and he killed them and the like. So this is a gesture of possession. Both of these things are important to you in the angelic conflict as they had physical uh, enemies and a domain you have spiritually the opposite okay we'll get in tonight to um, the uh, enemies of Jesus Christ but I wanted to begin addressing uh, the length of the angelic conflict and its intensified stages. Let's go uh, to Genesis chapter 3. Now, we believe that the length of human history is, is 7,000 years total. We believe that we can prove this beyond a shadow of a doubt. But if that is true from beginning to end, it means that just like with any competition that is, that is uh, based on time. Either, either you pin your enemy and, and you, you forfeit, say uncle, uh, whatever, or you, um, you go all the way to the, to the end of, of the time. We believe that God has allotted 7,000 years for this. Now, what this means, as we will study, is simply this. It's not over until the last day of the 7,000 years. I know that startles people when I say that, because you, you go to non-student churches, and, uh, oh, well, my Jesus, you know, my Jesus, is, we've won the victory, and you know, you're doubting him. I'm not doubting him at all. I believe he's going to pull it off. I, as I said in the, in the first service, he's got all my faith and trust. That's what's, what it's about. The angels doubted. Lucifer said, he can't do it. He's not worthy. You know what I say? He is absolutely worthy. I trust him. He's the Lord of glory and the Lord of history. And he's not only going to, has won the battles, he's going to win it overall. And I'm going to be there when, uh, share in his glory when there's the shout, ultimate shout of victory. Now that's my trust. Uh, and I don't care what, what they think. However, they're not facing up to something. When it started off, and we'll read these verses here, when it started off, there was a test. There was a competition. Lucifer tested man with regard to the angelic conflict, the first man, Adam. Guess what? We lost. You do realize that, don't you? When Adam succumbed to Lucifer's temptation and joined Lucifer in a revolt against Christ, the race of mankind lost. We're done. That's it. God should have right then and there. I mean, he's a lot more merciful than what I would be. Um, uh, God right then and there should have said, to hell with y'all. Uh, and he would have been just in doing so. But he didn't do it. Why? Because it's not solved in the few weeks of, uh, of uh, the dispensation of innocence. It's not solved until 7,000 years are over. 
for God the Father, for Jesus Christ, for Lucifer, for all of the angels, and for you and me, it ain't over till it's over. But the point that I'm making here is that from this time onward, uh, God and, um, and Debbie Harrington has a, has a, a, a good uh, illustration here uh, with regard to it. What's the name of that movie again? Uh, the du- yeah, Clash of the Titans. Duel of the Titans, Clash of the Titans. And if you've never seen it, it's a real old movie, but it's worth seeing just as an illustration. And uh, Zeus and all the other gods are up there, and they're playing a chess game, as it were, with and, and their pawns are uh, uh, people on Earth. And so uh, one will move here, and, and it'll help this person, and another will, will uh, uh, counter that with a move and, and the like. And that's what is happening. God is allowing Lucifer to attempt to defeat him by counter moves and counter punches all along the way. And again, I pointed out a good one. Um, The creation of a perfect man. How did Lucifer counter it? Testing him and having him fail. Oh, well, God, this, this creature that you have created, he's not so tough. Yeah, just wait till you see my son. <laughs> uh, you want tough? Just wait till you see my son. That's, uh, that's neither here nor there. Uh, but, uh, and all along the line, he tried to prevent. And I'll, I'll just name to you some of the more um, obvious features of preventing Jesus Christ from coming. That's what the angelic flood was about. The corruption of the human bloodline. You can't have a champion of humanity come if there's no humanity left. Christ is not going to take on the nature of angels or the nature of an animal. He must be a purebred human being. If you corrupt all of that, which was Satan's counter move, uh, then all of a sudden you're not going to have it. Now, do you know how close that that came uh, to losing? There were only how many people? Eight people left. See, sometimes whenever I I look out on on our church and I see a congregation dwindling and I see people not interesting, I see people bad-mouthing our ministry, I go back and I remember the the guys there that that stood firm. Think of uh, Noah. He preached to the whole world and it boiled down to himself and seven other people. Think of John the Baptist. Jesus Christ arrived on the scene and everybody went and followed the Lord. And you know what he said? Greatest, one of the greatest men of God ever walked this planet. He must increase and I must decrease. That's okay. Uh, that's what I'm here for, to introduce you to him. I, I preach Christ. I didn't preach myself. I can't save you, you see. Fantastic. But his congregation dwindled down. But think of Christ himself. At the end, how many stood true? Not a one. Smite the shepherd and what's going to happen to the sheep? They're scattered. He's, he quoted the scripture. Think of Paul. He spent all of his life in, in the, the, the Grecian countries and, and in Asia Minor and so forth. And finally, at the end of his life, he says, all that be in Asia have forsaken me, you say. So we're in good company. But he did say, I'm going to let the Bema do my talking. Uh, from henceforth, there waits for me a crown of righteousness. Why? Because I've kept the faith. It's not going to be given to me, but to all them that love his appearing. And even today, there are people who don't teach the rapture of the church. They don't love his appearing. They're not looking for his, the blessed hope in his, in his coming. So anyway, um, on down through, there were legitimate checkmates. Uh, it boiled down, as I mentioned the other night, to where one, uh, one servant, I believe, hid one baby. That, that if that baby would have been killed, uh, the line of Christ would, would have been annihilated. You come up to the birth of Christ. What did Herod try to do? Kill all the baby males from two years old and under. That is a ploy of Satan to try to keep uh, Christ from coming. Even the cross, actually, was his ploy. He thought if he could just get the world to put him to death, he'd be rid of him. For some reason, he must have missed the resurrection passages. Uh, you can't, you can't be, you know, you know uh, I'll be back. 
And here I am. Up from the grave he arose. Uh, here, uh, I'm, I, believe, I bet you their whole armies, they just threw a, a champagne caviar celebration. He's dead. We're rid of him. Three days later, he comes back from the dead, and death hath no more dominion over him. He can't be put to death ever again. And how do you ever conquer a foe that you can't kill? So God reversed it. Uh, Satan thinking he's accomplished something, and God uh, put him to flight. Now that was over a period of 4,000 years, and this is why I have confidence that it's going to be won. For 4,000 years, Lucifer has not won. But now mind you, from this point onward, what is one of the obvious things, from, uh, from the ascension of Christ onward, what is one of the obvious things with regard to time? There's less time remaining than there was at the beginning. And when there's less time remaining, you always begin to throw the kitchen sink at them. Uh, anything you have to win, you intensify your efforts, you escalate your activities. Now, especially is this true because right at this particular point, guess where we are? We're right there. 6,000 years of human history is about to, um, to expire, and there's only 1,000 years left. Obviously, Satan is going to intensify his efforts. So, let's look at it here. Uh, chapter 3 and verse number 15. This is the cornerstone verse of Operation Footstool. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, her seed, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And I explained uh, the, um, the analogy there with uh, regard to the snake bite and the snake's head being crushed. Now, since that promise was made, Lucifer did all that he could to prevent Christ from coming, to prevent Christ from being victorious. Uh, here is the Operation Footstool in a nutshell. Christ's head, a uh, foot rather, on the head of the serpent. Okay, but now, let's go to the book of Revelation, chapter 20. The book of Revelation, chapter 20. Revelation 20 and here we're, we're at, at at this point the final day we'll take this up uh, tonight we're not we're about out of time here uh, here we're at the last day of human history now how do we know that human history is uh, is the resolution of the angelic conflict. Well, after Adam is in the garden, who is the first personage we see in the garden testing Adam? Lucifer. We go all the way and we can tabulate 7,000 years in human history to the end, who is um, finally put in the lake of fire. Now remember, who or what was the lake of fire, excuse me, who was the lake of fire prepared for? the devil and his angels. Because they were not immediately put into the lake of fire, we must conclude something. That there was a court uh, held and that there was an appeal. We get these conclusions as well from the two titles, Satan and the devil, meaning the adversary and the accuser. They are attorney terms. Of course, uh, we knew that all along. But uh, anyway, uh, Revelation chapter 20, verse number 10. This is the end of human history. The devil that deceived them. He started all the way with the deception of Eve originally, 7,000 years back, was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Point. 
The last great enemy of Jesus Christ is death. How does he get rid of death or subdue death? Because he came and died on the cross to destroy him that had the power of death. Who was that? The devil, says the book of, of Hebrews. So, with placing the devil into the lake of fire, with eradicating the old sin nature, which was the, the cause of death, and we'll see that. Um, at this point, it ends. That's the last enemy destroyed. And of course, uh, following that is the great white throne, uh, and uh, he throws all unbelieving humanity, and death and hell were placed into the lake of fire. So that's the point where his final enemy, death, is conquered, and eternity future goes uh, from that point onward. Okay, I'm just going to touch on two things here uh, with regard to the intensified stages, and then we're going to close. The intensified stages of the angelic conflict have to do, one, with human history, and two, with individual dispensations remaining. From the point of the cross to the end, time is running out. That's phase one. Lucifer, as well as Christ, is uh, uh, having to deal with the concept of time. If they're going to win it, they've got to win it within this certain amount of time. Winner take all at that point. So, as we now know, because we're here and human history is about ended, Satan is going to intensify his efforts. Now, I know you wanted, you wanted to be blessed and thrilled from the Word of God this morning. You, you wanted three points in a poem. You wanted somebody to stroke your emotions and, and, and so forth. And here is somebody saying, it's going to get worse before it gets better. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Only six more months, months to go. And I've given you an early Christmas present. But again, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be what? Uh, to, uh, to, to the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now what does that mean? Well, to whom much is given, what? Much is required, but the reverse of that is true. Of whom much is required, what? Much is given. The intensified stages, you know what that means? That's a challenge to me. It means to me that perhaps some of the best thrones still awaiting the church in the second heaven, some of the highest power thrones are still available for the people who are alive and remain. That they're not taken up as yet. Why? Because the challenge is going to intensify, and with the challenge, God has to reward accordingly. So that just simply means that there are some thrones out there waiting that are up the ranks, if we'll just go get them. Okay, we'll deal with that. Now, see, now that was a good gift, wasn't it? Yeah, okay. Phase two is the individual dispensations. Um, in each of the individual dispensations, as, as they come to a close, Satan intensifies his efforts, which means that we must as well intensify our efforts in order to defeat him, because he's going to throw everything he can at us.